Welcome back to Season 2, Episode 9 of the Home Health Care Today Show. It is National Nurses Month. And yes, we have the pleasure of speaking today with Dr. Rash. Dr. Rash, we're going to pick up right where we left off prior to... Oh, I know, (laughs) right? (laughs) So prior to commercial, we talked a little bit about... Um, the national nursing shortage, right? And you gave some really brilliant insight about um, not only compensation and treatment of nurses, but you went a little bit further and you talked about how in the future and even present day, we may have to begin to repurpose how uh, nurses' technical skills are used Uh, Even in view of how nurses or non-nurses may be able to step in and provide some of that that care that you mentioned, where you talked about how some patients just need a companion or need someone to to listen to them and spend time. And the nurse, who is patient-focused and person-centric, will know the times that their technical and interpersonal <clears throat> skill is needed, but being able to utilize the, the skills of, of others. Yeah, I think one of the things, as you say that, I would say a couple of things. <clears throat> so when I started, we had uh, nursing assistants, nurses' aides, and yes. orderlies. Yes. And um, I remember um, we had a gentleman who needed to be on the bedpan. Yes. And um, the supervisor was making rounds through the hospital, so I gave her an update, and I said, and I put him on the, the um, bedpan, and she said, why'd you do that? You have an orderly. And I said, because I was there. I was there, right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, so what a nursing assistant or an orderly can do is be the second eyes and hands for you so that they can do some of that care because you've got to be thinking. And it doesn't mean that you're better than them and, and are going to sit there and just do whatever. But you figure out when you're going to go in and give a bed bath or when you're going to do this. So when you're making the workout, Mm -hmm. it is, what does this patient need right now? What do I know about this patient? And I need to spend more time with this patient. So I'll do the bed bath today or I'll do whatever it is today. So that piece of it. And then I think the other piece, I remember years ago when I was at UNC Chapel Hill, they have the area health education centers. And I think North Carolina is the only state where the area health care, area health education centers cover the entire state. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> they have them in other states, but it's, you know, blotchy. Yes. But um, I had agreed to speak to, uh, they were doing an in-service for nursing assistants. Yes. And I agreed to do it. And they said, we want to talk to, we want you to talk to them about upscaling, upscaling, up, up, updating their skills and all of that. So I agreed to do that. Mm-hmm. But then as I thought about it and I got closer to doing <laughs> it, I thought, I'll bet you they already know how to do all this stuff. <clears throat> so when I got there and I said, I said, well, I'm shifting what I'm going to talk about. And they said, oh, what are you going to talk about? I said, I'm going to talk about the discipline of nursing and I'm going to talk about working with families. They freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I said, but yeah. I, so when I talked, I said, you all are nursing assistants. How many of you have done this for five years or more? Almost all of them raised their hands. Yes. How many of them have done it for two years or whatever? And they raised hands. How many have done it one year? Very few of them had done it one for, for one year. So yes. everything they wanted me to talk about, they knew how to do. Yeah. And I said, so I figured that you all know how to do this, this, and I named it all that. And they went, oh, yeah, we don't need to hear about that. Mm-hmm. And I said, so I'm going to talk about the discipline of nursing. <clears throat> and I said... I'm going to talk about that because while you are not nurses, you are participating in what the discipline of nursing is and what nurses do. So I talked about the discipline of nursing, what it's structured like and what that means and what that meant for care of patients and all of that. And then I talked about families, the the next part, the the next day, and I, I mean the next, the afternoon, and I said, you all are working with, pe- how many of you are working with people who have families that are coming in and all that, and they did it? So I walked through different ways of doing family assessment and all that. Yes. And then after we did it, I said, so we've talked about how to assess families and all of that kind of thing. 
but it can help you in another way too. And they all looked, I said, you all work in an organization. Yes. They said, yes. And I said, it has an organizational structure and yeah. functioning. Sure so everything is. we've talked about, how to look at family members and how to work with families and all that, you can apply it to where you work. Yes, you can. Because you're working with colleagues, you're working with administrators, there's an organizational structure with policies and procedures, but there's a way of doing things, and mm -hmm. sometimes there are issues. This, if you think about it as a family, it's how to do that too. Yes, so talking about if we do things with folks who are helping nursing, what we have to remember is they're doing nursing. Yes, they are. They're just not doing what it is that would be not regulator regulatorily they shouldn't be doing. Sure. But they're doing nursing. And as you help them grow to do that, <clears throat> they'll know when you want to take, <clears throat> they'll know, understand when you say, you know, I want to do this part of, I'm going to do this part of the care today. We'll have you do this. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm doing this is this, because I need to establish a relationship with this patient. Yes. You need to as well and know how to do that and know what to do. But I need to do that, too, from a professional standpoint. Absolutely. So it's the thinking that we need to be doing. And, you know, as we talk about this, uh -huh. um, I should say, so um, I'm a member and do things at the National Organization of Nurse Practitioner Faculty and all that. Yes. The American Association of Nursing is the dean's group. And I was on the board of directors. Mm -hmm. And so I know the conversations we're having Yes. are conversations that the board was having and, mm -hmm. and dealing with people. And I would say things and I'd go, yep, that's what I've been saying. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, not, it's not just me. It's no. coming, you know, we're even beginning to look at, we threw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> when we move from diploma education to BSN, there, we needed to do that. Yes. But at the BSN, we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. There were things that you learned to do as, as that, and I know it because I went to a program that had been a BSN program, like three, a, a diploma program, like three or four years before me. Mm -hmm. And those faculty really taught us to be what we considered professional nurses and yes. how to behave and all of that. And I remember, um, so, so it's a need to look back at this again. For instance, you know, in a diploma program, the students provided care in the hospital that they were being educated in. And the problem was they weren't being treated as students, sure. you know. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to do that. And we've put in barriers and things that we need to take down. Mm -hmm. There is no reason why a school or a college of nursing can't collaborate with a practice area, a hospital or whatever. Because exactly. they can do this. Mm -hmm. And you might even pay them. Mm -hmm. Yes but make sure that they're meeting the standards of care and it feeds into how they're achieving academically. And so when I was in a program, we did a lot more. And we, because we lived next door, we could wander in and say, um, I would like to learn this. And the nurses, so we need to get through these barriers of insurance and all of that, but the nurses would say, oh, come on in. We'd work in intensive care, and there was technical care that we didn't get to do. Yes. We'd come in our lab coat. They uh -huh. would teach us how to do it, and then we would do it. Because when you're in school, yep. the opportunity may not come in because that may not be what's happening on the floor at True. that time. True. So there's, you know, we need to relook at that model of education mm -hmm. and what does it do. And when you do that, then you have the nurses that are in the hospital or the clinical area really become collaborators with the educators. And both of, both of those are working to how do we grow and develop this nurse. Wow. So those are all things that I think we have to be looking at. Um, and then how do we effectively use nurses? Remember I said that we could make assignments for students that was just busy work. True. We can do it in clinical areas too. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a BSN prepared person to do certain care. No. And if you don't have enough nurses, why are you making them do all of that when they can work effectively in teams so that person can do the care and keep you informed of what they're seeing and, yes. and all that, which helps you decide, oh, today I need to spend more time with this person. Absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Rash. Dr. Rash, in, um, 
from the, those examples there, uh, you have really been able to take um, scholarship, you know, research, um, years of experience in multiple settings, right? You've been able to take that and yield community impact. And I think that's one of the mm. challenges oftentimes we see in bridging academia to the streets as we know it yeah. <laughs> and into the lives <clears throat> of patients and in, in households. Uh, Dr. Rash, you want to tell us a little bit about um, one of the uh, state um, task forces, uh, one of the committees that uh, the governor has assigned you to, and, and how do you believe you're able to deliver some community impact in that role? So before I say that, okay. I'll just yes. say uh -huh. another thing, because as you were talking, so when the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. and we were having changes in education, the American yeah. Association of Colleges Nursing was doing a podcast about leading in this, and they uh -huh. asked me to do it. Uh -huh. And one of the statements I made was, every nurse is a public health nurse. Mm -hmm. I would say it even broader. Every nurse is a community health nurse. Yes. And so whether or not you work in a hospital or an inpatient setting or, or um, a clinic or yeah. in the streets, like you said, yes. you should have that mindset and you should think about it. Absolutely. So all of us can serve as an individual. Yes at the clinical level, mm -hmm. but we can also serve at another level because nurses bring something yeah. that other provider, they bring a perspective that's needed. And so when we talk about the governor's task force, I think one of the things, um, I'll talk about the coronavirus racial disparities task force because what was recognized was that as the pandemic hit, the people who were most adversely affected by it were African Americans, but as we did our work, it's not just African Americans, it's people of color, yes. Native Americans, it's inmates yes. coming out of prison, you know, people on parole, all yes. of those disadvantaged folks that might be falling through the cracks. Yes. And so I think when we did some, we are doing, still doing some great work with that task force, but the first thing that we were doing was how do we get people tested and all of that? And there were two, teams that I think I can say I was leading one of those teams, but uh, Brenda Jackety out of the uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services led the team on testing. Yes. And what we were looking at was that people who were disadvantaged and minorities, and within the minority population, they didn't have to be disadvantaged. They could be middle class or whatever, but they were experiencing certain, seeing certain things. Yes. Access to testing, mm -hmm. And then, as the vaccines came in, access to vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I led the Primary Care Connections work group, and that's an amazing team. And what we said all along is, we need to take this yes. to the people. Because you talked about the future, that's also the future. We are used to providing care where we want to provide it. True. Because we like the control of a hospital or whatever. Yes. We gotta get that crap up. Did I say crap? It's okay. I understand. I understand. <laughs> well, I didn't use we another to, word. We have to shift our paradigm. <laughs> we, yes. So, yes. so one of the things we did, and I have to uh, give hats off to Dr. Philip Levy out of Wayne State, yes. who is an emergency department, works out of the emergency department, but one of the things he'd been doing is using bands to yes. take care. And so we were taking the testing to people yes. because the way the testing worked was even if you could drive up, yes, you had to drive up. Had to drive so up. if you came in a taxi, you couldn't sit there in a taxi. If you didn't have any money anyway, no. you, could, you couldn't do that. Yes. You couldn't come on a bus nope. and you could, all of that. So we're like, we need to take that where they are. And, and Brenda Jackety was doing a great job of identifying sites, you know, that work. Yes. And then what we wanted to do with primary care was what are the services that people are getting? Yes. Can we get them connected to services? And these are things that were already existing within the state. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, you know the way you get people enrolled in care and all that. So we were trying to leverage that enrollment at the point of contact. So when you tested, yes. you could get a history about, are you seeing a primary care provider and all of that and Absolutely. begin to do those things. Absolutely. And we want to use that, wanted to use that as a model for when a vaccine came, mm -hmm. you can already begin to do that. 
There was some modest success with that, but I think it's really what it is we can do. Yes. So when we talk about, um, let me quit moving that. When we talk about what nurses can do and leverage that, there are a couple of things. We can act this way at the clinical level. Mm -hmm. So if I work in an inpatient unit, who is this patient? Mm -hmm. Where did they come from? Yes. Do they have access to regular primary care services or did they come here through the emergency department or an yes. urgent, did, that, did that happen? And how do we do that? When I was a public health nurse and doing home health, one of the things I did initiated way back then was discharge planning. So the hospital I worked in, once a week I would make rounds yes. and I began, the nurses begin to understand Oh, there's a collaborative thing. Yes. So they could make nurse to nurse referrals because the physicians weren't thinking yes. about it. Exactly. So they, I would have, you remember, they used to have card X's back then on each <laughs> patient. So I had a notebook <laughs> and I had a list and I would keep a list of names yes. of patients. And I would take the information down and I had their address. So when I went back to the health department, Remember I said there were four of us for Benton Harbor, four for the rest of the county. Yes. So I knew by where they were, which public health nurse would have them. So I'd get them updated. And of course, this still happens. Yes. They think they're going to be discharged in a week. And all of a sudden, oh. they charge, discharged them on a Friday. Yes. But the nurses already knew. And because of that, I could connect them with the nurses in the hospital. The great thing was, as they began to know each other, the nurses in the hospital would tell me, but they could figure out who the nurse would be. They'd call directly and say, this person's going to go home, blah, 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 blah. So that's thinking community health-wise. Yes, it is. And if you think community health-wise, this person may not need home health, but they're going to need these kinds of services. True. Some of those may be public health or other, other kinds. So it's that collaborative piece. Yes, it is. And then if you know that, then when there are task forces, maybe it's statewide, maybe it's just right there in the community. And if you are a citizen of the state or that community and you're a nurse, you can give that input and say, this is important. And I need to be at the table, Absolutely. or a nurse needs to be at the table because we're going to contribute this perspective. So then we have this more seamless Continual kind of thing. And you Absolutely. know, when you think about that, mm -hmm. so when I was a public health nurse, we went to schools. Yes. Some schools had public had school nurses. Yep. Some didn't. Uh -huh. We went to uh, um, nursing homes. Yes. We certified for Medicare and Medicaid care in the nursing home. The nurse the public health nurse did that. They do different things like that now, but there are opportunities for all nurses to do it. And I know that some hospitals are doing something really interesting in terms of home health. Yes. Um, and this has saved uh, rural access hospitals in some places. Yes. So you have somebody who's airlifted out of a rural area to yes. go to the city because they have the nurses who know it and the units who know it. Yes. There are places that have done something progressive where rather than airlifting that person out, the nurse in this critical in a, in a critical care unit or coronary care unit or whatever, they may have an assignment that isn't providing care for that shift duty. They're connected to a nurse in a rural access area yes. that has intensive care, but uh -huh. it's not sp specialty driven. Yes. So they'll have cardiac, they'll have diabetes or whatever, and they have nurses that are connected with them. They can actually see the patient and talk with the nurse directly because these nurses know how to care. They know how to give the technical care, but they may need a collaborator on thinking through about this area because they're not always dealing with a coronary care patient. So when we think about all of that kind of stuff and uh -huh. what is that nursing can do, those are things that you can do. And if you have those experiences, yes. then you can speak up in your community sure and can. say, these are things that we can do as nurses or that physicians can do, but you're not getting it, you know, that other thing. And then I have to tell you a funny story. Okay. When I was a public health <laughs> nurse doing home health, I, was, I had a group of, I had three patients 
that all had the same physician, and I happened to see them one day, mm-hmm. and I was I um, stopped by his office because mm-hmm. they owned their own offices back then. Yeah. So I stopped by his office. I didn't see him, but I said to um, his receptionist, I said, yes. "So I just came back from seeing these three people." Yes, and I said. So I want you to look on his calendar and block off this morning because <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm going to pick him up so he can go on home visits. So uh, a month later when I pulled up in, he was standing outside the door in his lab coat and uh-huh. he knew, he knew me from when we worked in the hospital when yes. he, I was there and he saw me and I rolled down the window. He saw me, he recognized me and he said, come on. He came over, he got in the car and he said, What are we doing? They just told me you were picking me up. I said, we're going on home visits. (laughs) There you go. And off we went, and we saw each of these patients because he got to do what he needed to do without them coming in. Yes. And he could bill for it. Yeah. And he got to see where they lived and what they were doing. Yes. And he got to... because I could tell it to him, but we could be there together and talk about the care yes. and, and really collaborate on it. And so when we finished, and I took him back to the office, and he looked at me and said, this was great. Can we do it again? I said, no problem. You're already scheduled <laughs> for another month. <laughs> so those are, the, those are the ways that we uh-huh. have to think and yes. think communally and yep. think of who's in the community, who's yes. involved in the care. How do we do this? in a team kind of way Wonderful, and so right. nurses yes. can do that mm-hmm. and that way we really make partners with the family with yes. the patient and with the providers and the other services in the community if we're going to move we've got to do that stuff systematically not just individual nurse by individual nurse True. we have to leverage this up into system ways of thinking absolutely and do it Dr. Rash, you are a proponent of home health care. I mean, that oh, yeah. <laughs> that really, really dives into the, the next question. We have like one or two more for you. Okay, Dr. Rash, so you are a proponent, proponent of home health care in, in what you just <laughs> shared there in that piece. Um, the city of Detroit, for example, uh, according to the Detroit Area on Aging, has 40,000 homebound. Residents. Yes, that's the word homebound. Yes, sir. And they define it by chronic illness that mm-hmm. prevents a person from regularly leaving their home mm-hmm. or some of those mobility issues and challenges. So, to your point, uh, a city like Detroit that has 40,000 homebound and then uh, 11% of the population is senior citizens. So, 11 out of close to 700,000 residents is. Uh, uh, a major, major chunk there, about 72,000 or so seniors. So homebound care as a part of the public health conversation, mm-hmm. I believe is a vital, vital part of our future. For sure. and, and I know what I realized when I came back here was that what we were doing in Benton Harbor isn't the same oh. from state to state. So, uh, you know, I'm, like I said, I've, d- I've lived all my adult life in the South. Yes. So in Michigan, when I was here, public health was county by county. Yes. So, for example, in North Carolina, mm-hmm. public health is the entire state. Mm-hmm. So you might be in a county, but you're hired at the state level. Yes. So there's some, some advantages system-wise thinking about that because you get to standard standardize a lot of those. We had a shock or problem as I was leaving Michigan, and this was, um, you know, uh, funding individual programs, Mm -hmm. which fragmented the care that we were giving, because you would enroll them in maternal child health and use up all those visits, and then where were they going? But if you were a public health nurse, you were a generalist, and you knew how to advantage all those things. But you mentioned what's going on in... um, in Detroit yes. and um, just the elderly in general, but in yes. particularly minority and disadvantaged elderly yes. who may not know that they have, you know, the community doesn't even think, oh, that's too expensive, we can't afford it, and all that kind of stuff. Yes. So we have a fall in the cracks there. And I think mm-hmm. I was telling you that when I was a public health nurse, combined home health nurse, because we did both. Yes. Um, so, you know, some of our public health patients, <laughs> you know, we were de- visiting them for chronic care, but if they needed specific stuff, 
we'd fill out the paperwork, go to the physician and said, this person needs home health, they'd sign it and away we would go. Yes. But I was <laughs> sharing with you that we were trying to increase revenue because we needed more nurses and the county couldn't afford it. Yeah. So we were leveraging who we could. And so we were signing up infants yes. who were technically homebound and needed the care. <laughs> yes. And all we'd say, well, let's try it. And if they, de if they deny the payment, we could still do the care. Well, they paid us. Sure. But um, so I'm a proponent of home care within a system of care that really looks at the importance of community-based care. Yes. And anymore, we're doing acute care. They're calling it hospitals at home and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yes. There's a problem with that yes. because, um, you know, I remember when I was at UNC Greensboro, the med surge faculty wanted students to go do home, to go do home visits. And they said, oh, we're doing blah, blah, blah. And, and the faculty and community go, no, you're not. You're doing med surge at home. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Yes. So you need, because then you just focus on the technical skill and get out. Right. But, and I think I told you that I, um, when I was at UNC Chapel Hill, I had students in community health, and they did it in a home health agency. Mm -hmm. So they had to give the care that was required by home health, but the agency also gave us the freedom to educate them to be community health nurses in home health. Mm -hmm. Nurses who are in home health need to learn what it means to be doing community care. So it's not moving med surge at home. No. You may be doing care that's med surge, but you need to be thinking like a community nurse. And if you're thinking about it like a community nurse, what are the resources in the community that not just this family need, this yes. individual needs, but what might the family need? Absolutely. Because that's going to affect the individual care. We used to do an ancient thing. I'm kind of an ancient because I'm old. But... Um, <laughs> We used to do case finding. That's sort of lost. Yes, so if yes. there was a referral for a particular patient, and it might be an infant, yes. our charts at the health department weren't individual charts. They were family, family, family charts. charts. So when we got everybody, yes. we did an assessment on everybody. And so we found people who needed care, who yes. needed to get to a primary care provider. Right. Any of them. We did sure. all that. So this seamlessness needs to happen. It does. Every nurse needs to think. I'm a community health nurse, no matter where my place of employment is. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Resch, because that example you just provided, you're looking at the nuclear family, even if it is that uh, the baby, from a pediatric lens, knowing that perhaps um, the mom could have some postpartum issues, right? The other caregivers in the house, siblings, uh, extended family, aunts and uncles could oh, yeah. also be some folks that are in need of, of home health care and, and other public public services. And I'm glad you mentioned that. You yeah. have to know the community, yes. not just the city or whatever, the community. Yes. So the other thing that we have was we had a high referral rate on infants that were at risk. Yes. And for a lot of them, it was because their mothers were teenagers. Yes. And I remember... You know, we looked at how we did aid to dependent children and mm -hmm. all of that. I don't know how that's changed, but back then, mm -hmm. the agency, the public agency that was doing that, mm -hmm. um, it was a problem if the father was involved. Mm -hmm. You have a teenage mother. So I made it, I was, you know, I was the first African-American male public health nurse, but I may have been the first male public health nurse. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I did was I would say to the moms, you know, they're 13, 14, 15 years old. I yeah. said, is the baby's father, are you still in a relationship with the baby's father? Half the time they weren't in the first place. But if they had been, but no longer were, I would say, is the baby's father still involved? Mm -hmm. And usually, even if they had been boyfriend or girlfriend or something, and they had broken up, the parents still had a relationship with each, with each other, and most of the fathers did. Yes. We make a mistake in how we think about that. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to come back. If you tell the baby's father, have him come visit. And yes. I remember the first time it happened. It was summer. We were sitting on the porch, and I was holding this kid, playing with it, sure. with him. And this teenager walked up. He was about 14 or 15, and he walked up, and he started talking. And... And I just realized, 
this is the baby's father. Mm. So I included him in the visit and, you know, I was talking to her, she asked questions and I said, well, I don't, you know, so he asked questions, I answered them. And then as we were winding down, he went, well, I've got to go. Mm. And off he went. Yes. But that word spreads in the community. Yes, it does. And those fathers start showing up. Yes. We don't give that into them to yes. help them do this. And I just talked to somebody who was at UNC Greensboro. She was, I think she's been hired at UT Austin. But her research, and she was in the School of Social Work, her research was doing exactly that. Yes. Getting to fathers about... Mm-hmm being involved and the interesting thing was it wasn't just the father teenage father but it was getting their fathers involved too right. so you have some father yes. and they were working with those fathers to help them think differently about fathering or leveraging their strengths and to support their son in fathering as well Wow, this is community nice. work yes it is and it's work that nurses can do we can be doing other people but nurses are often the first contact we need to be thinking like this. Absolutely. Dr. Rash, as we wrap up here with our final concluding question, I do want to, of course, um, you know, thank you for you know, all of the insight during this interview. Um, you mentioned early on in the interview that you're an optimist. You're very optimistic. And I believe that that um, helps to electrify, if you will, if that's fair, helps to uh, ignite and electrify so much of the great work that you've done because you are a a deep thinker and you think deeply and differently about health and about challenges and about people and communities. And you strayed away uh, from from the tendency of saying patient a lot uh, to more so a person and and people because I believe that that's what we're about mm-hmm. you know in the whether it's uh, home health care whether it's health care in a clinical setting whether it's community based per se it's certainly about helping people yes uh, so as we wrap up this National Nurses Month uh, episode is there anything that you want to say to the people people mm-hmm. that's people you know people specific because we covered a lot. Of, uh, of good good topics yeah. in this episode, but uh, I think at the heart of it, uh, you are uh, inspiration to so many people, you know, in and outside of this of this great work that you've done in your career. Thanks. This is this is uh, things like this always help me think, and it helps me spur my thinking further. Yes. I think it's interesting that you picked up, because I didn't realize I was doing it, but yes. I think it's interesting <laughs> that you picked up that I didn't say patience. So uh, my dissertation is a long title, but the core of it is the discipline of nursing. And the discipline, any discipline has a subject matter and a perspective <laughs> on the subject matter. Yes. The subject matter of nursing is the same subject matter as medicine, mm-hmm. but it's a holistic Thing. Yes. So the subject matter is human beings, yep. health, multidimensional health, society, and by society I mean individuals or groups of individuals that have an impact on someone's health yes. or, or a group of people's health, and the environment. Yes. So the environment we made or the natural environment and how it affects health. So I deliberately, as I did that work, began to realize in nursing, we have to get away from talking about patients. Yes. Our subject matter interest is human beings. Yes. Because when I have this patient, mm. they're a patient here, but they came here as a holistic human being. Yes, they did. And if I focus on them as a patient, then that may have that gets truncated. I'll give you an example. If you work in the hospital and they schedule, you know, they prescribe medications. Yes. QID four times a day. Right? In the hospital, we're waking up people to give medications. True. Why? <laughs> and so, yeah. so <laughs> patients will complain about it. You're waking me up. Right. Why are nurses not saying to physicians, do you really want this four times a day? Mm. Because if you order it this way, this is how it's going to be given. And when they go home, are you going to want them to take it that way because it's not going to happen? <laughs> no. So you have, so that's the conversation. 
do you really want it four times a day because while they're here, you want to stabilize and do that? Yeah. If it doesn't have to be, let's not. Mm -hmm. So that's looking at the human being, yes. what their life is and all of that. When we don't, yes. and here's the control part, you can work in a hospital like it's a factory. Mm. You can work in a hospital so that the schedule is to the benefit of the nurse to get this work done, yes. which means this patient has to get this done here, this done here, this done here, this done here. Mm. Can we be more flexible in that? Mm. That's a conversation to have with our colleagues who are physicians when they're ordering certain things or we're developing a plan of care for nursing. Yeah. One of the things that happens when you get into the community, yes. and you, I think I said this before, <laughs> But when we work inpatient, we have to remember the mantra that I think I said. Yes. It is not about me. No. And that is in all kinds of levels. When you work in the community, when you work in, um, especially in public health, but to some extent, home health, yeah. you recognize you have no control. Absolutely. <laughs> you gotta work to get this to get this done together. So I think the thing that I would say about National Nurses Week and what it is, to be grounded in the discipline which gives a perspective about how we do things mm -hmm. and that the primary thing that we're about is providing and serving human beings. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we categorize them as patients, we've truncated that and made them what we want it to be to do that. So, but I, the only other thing I would say is that this has been a challenging couple of years or so for nursing. Yes. And I've talked to his colleagues who are older than me and, and, and all of that. But one of those discussions is, in spite of all that, I'm so grateful mm -hmm. that I made the decision at age 16 or 17 yes. to become a nurse. I didn't know what I was doing yeah. at the time, but it was the right decision. And I've had talks with colleagues who are saying the same thing, those in practice, those who are in education. I'm so proud and grateful for our colleagues that are on the front line yes. providing care okay. and our colleagues on the front line of doing the administrative structuring to support those folks okay. who are doing um, who are doing direct care. Okay. And I think if there's any message that I want to get across in national in, in Nurses Week is exactly that. We have so much to be proud of in yes. terms of what it is that nurses are doing and the impact that nurses quietly have. And the thing I'm grateful for is more and more people, the average person is beginning to realize yeah. what the importance of nursing is beyond what they thought it was Absolutely. and the impact that they can have. And so for those of you who are out there that, it, that are nurses, mm -hmm. I hope you take this and see this as something to be proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I hope that you do is really talk to those people who are not nurses. Those may be physicians, sure. your neighbor, yes. whoever it is, so that they know what it is you do, yeah. because that's gonna help transform the service and the care that we provide the human beings that, that come to us. I sure will. Dr. Rash, thank you so much. Thank you again. And happy Nurses Month to you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>